Hey everyone, uh, welcome back to Cybersecure TV. Uh, this week we're going to start a new series uh, on explaining through the OWASP Top 10. Of course, the first one we're going to start with is the injection attacks, and as we move on, we'll we'll talk about the other Top 10 attacks as well. So let's uh, let, let's see in like you know the description what's the OWASP injection attack as per the OWASP uh, definition. So it's an injection flow such as SQL OS and LDAP injection occurs when untrusted data is sent to an interpreter as part of a command or a query. The attacker's hostile data can trick the interpreter into executing unintended commands or accessing data without proper authorization. Now let's break this down and explore what this actually means. So fundamentally, injection attacks violate the basic security concept of access control. So access control says that each role or user should have specific access to certain system functions and data. So uh, in the security industry, we can say like, you know, need to know basis. So access will be granted on a need to know basis. The thing about the software or the web application in particular is that it's not as easy as putting a big heavy physical door between the individuals that are supposed to have access and those that are not. So, uh, of course, in the physical security, we have a badge reader or something that we put that, like, you know, uh, put, we install it and then we avoid unauthorized users to get into the office or, or read anything. Now, in the web application of the software, it's a bit different. So, one of the key functions of the web application is to connect people over the Internet. And we all know Internet has a many threat uh, vectors or, or threat actors, uh, per se, like uh, malicious users. So from a security perspective, this means that the data which is put into processed and stored by web application may come from a variety of different sources. Some of these sources can be trusted and others should not be. So you cannot trust, for example, if there is a Gmail account, you cannot trust every request that the user makes, but whether the intention is ethical or unethical. So you have to validate each and every user input. Uh, that, that is the core concept behind the injection attack. Now, in a typical use case, a web application accepts the data input from a user and executes command that does not something with the input. So, for example, here is the user and uh, here is the application. Now, a user can give untrusted input or it can give a trusted input. Now, when it comes to the application, it has to validate both the inputs irrespective of whether it's trusted, uh, it's coming from trusted or untrusted user because you don't know. It's on the internet and anyone can and anyone can make a request. So uh, a web application accepts the data input from a user and execute command that does something with the input. In the case of injection attack, a malicious user right can submit uh, untrusted data which is then operated on by the application. Now, if the application treats untrusted data in the same way that it treats trusted data, then there's a potential for either malicious or unintended behavior to occur. So if the user X uh, says, I need data for, uh, for my bank account, and of course, the application is gonna go back to the database, fetch the information, and get back to the user. Now, assume uh, the same user request the bank account details of user Y. Now that's not ethical, that should not be a valid use case. So application has to validate and then prevent that. And that that's that's how like you know you prevent the injection attacks or that's how the injection attack happens. Now uh, many of the technologies that are vulnerable to injection, uh, such as SQL, we know it's popular SQL injection or the LDAP injection, XPath injection or the NoSQL injection. So one way to think about software and how it interacts with the digital database and other structure of managing storing information is to imagine that you have got a file cabinet and a robot. So uh, like just look like you know probably in your house you have a you have a file cabinet where you keep like different files such as you have your taxes, you have your insurance details, you have some uh, like you know contracts or, or whatever like th those are in the different file cabinets and then you have a robot who you can command of course we don't have right now but who you can command and it will fetch something from that cabinet and give it to you so for example I can ask okay give me the tax record from 2019 right it will go in and it will 
uh, fetch the tax records of 2019 and give it to me. Now, what if that's a very proprietary information, and of course it's a proprietary information which only I and only I should have access to. So what if somebody uh, other than me commands to the robot that, okay, give me tax for 2019. Now, it should not. Or what if that person says, give me all the tax uh, tax information. It should not because he is not the authorized user to get this detail. Right? So now, uh, here is the similar query. So like how it works in the application. So there is, suppose there is a select star from files where type home insurance and year is equal to 2017. So I'm requesting Robo to give me home insurance uh, from the year 2017. Now this statement intend to select all the files. Now suppose uh, what I've done is I have added uh, the or condition and I put a is equal to a. Now everyone knows this is this is like true every time. So whenever uh, the attacker or the malicious actor attaches this to the uh, query, of course, like you know, um, it's like giving the robot instruction card that simply says, "Robot, I want all the documents." Basically, that's how injection works. When a software application takes in the data input and interprets it as a change to a command, pretty much anyone who is able to send the data to the application can tell it what to do. And that's what, uh, as a software developer, you want to avoid. Now let's talk about the impact. What are the impact that the injection attacks could have? Uh, one of the uh, impact is an attacker might be able to access data, change data, or even delete the data. So injection attack mostly commonly affects uh, the SQL LDAP, right? Uh, that we talked about, so they can use all of these queries and, and use to modify, change, or even just view the data. Now, the other, uh, the first scenario we're going to talk about is the medium and small size org are more vulnerable than the large ones. So, uh, there's, there's always a thought like uh, small and medium organization does not have a big impact if this is get exploited and and I completely disagree with that because I actually think it's a contrary because the big organization ha have enough budget or maybe resources to protect the res uh, of course they have a complex environment but they have enough resources to protect against such attacks now the medium and small org might not so uh, like you know they might be storing and of course as far as the sensitivity of the data goes medium a uh, size company can store the sensitive data as uh, as the similar to any larger organization. So the sensitivity of the data is the same. It's all about like whether you have the right controls in place. And I guess the big companies have bigger budgets and resources they can protect against this. So it's pretty much everyone should pay attention uh, to this sort of attacks. And, and that's the reason it's been on the top of the list for the OAS for quite a few years now. Now, uh, attacker can use like a SQL injection attack to access hundreds of customer credit card data, right? Uh, which uh, this organization, uh, this small org is storing, and and the uh, and they can also get a fine. So, like I know there is one incident uh, in UK somewhere where the cust uh, that the, there was a breach for the credit card information, and then the ICO uh, information commissioner office determined that the company was violated of the UK data, UK data Protection Act, and then they got fined for fifty five thousand pounds, which is equivalent to around eighty thousand dollars US dollars, I guess. Now, uh, the other scenario is uh, that there there was also like you know a stealing of voter information stored in the DB via SQLI. So there is also an incident like uh, which happened recently. Uh, when I say recently, it was like three, couple years ago, I guess. Yeah. So in the United States election, uh, there was a, f uh, like you know, f uh, in the country's f history where there was a cyber a cyber issue, uh, uh, was discussed and debated. So this particular attack uh, did not affect the actual votes of the citizens of the state of uh, Illinois, but rather the information contained in the water registration database. So late in the summer, uh, the IT team at the Illinois State Board of Election uh, noticed a spike in the web traffic hitting the online voter application web page, and the information was being stolen from the database. It was later determined that the way in which the hackers got in was via SQL injection. 
and the website was vulnerable because they had failed properly secure all of their input pages on the web page. So uh, th th there is a huge impact on uh, because of this attack because you are pretty much giving uh, unlimited access to your data to someone who you are you are not even trusting, uh, and that's the reason. Like you know, uh, we have to be very cognizant about uh, when we are implementing such uh, controls. Uh, the first control we can implement is input validation, right? So the first step is to preventing and avoiding injection attack is to validate data inputs. And that's not just one input or two inputs. It's like for all the inputs you have on any page, and, and including headers and uh, uh, like website headers, user agent headers, and, and hidden fields, everything. So as early as possible in the workflow, the application should check to make sure that the data input actually matches what is expected when it comes to attributes like type, length, format, expected values. Uh, let's take an example. An input field that is supposed to take in a birthday is likely to take a number for a year, a day, uh, either a number or a string of text like January for the month. If user is entering data that does not conform to this requirement, the application should reject it or should consider potential malicious. There are two basic ways to approach the input validation. The first is to define what is not allowed. This is called blacklisting. A blacklisting approach to input validation might involve trying to detect potential dangerous characters, like apostrophe or the strings like equals or equals one, which is always true, or the script tag. Uh, we have seen this bunch of examples in our XSS series where we have seen like, you know, the firewalls are using uh, sort of like blacklisting approach, which are easy to bypass. And that's why I always prefer whitelisting. In our earlier uh, example of the file cabinet, uh, you can see how adding certain malicious character can completely change the meaning, right? Uh, we just added like a apostrophe A is equal to A. So if a character on the blacklist is detected, then the application won't process the data. The second way to do input validation is to define what is allowed. That is called a whitelisting, which I usually prefer. So in the birthday example we talked about just a few moments ago, this is the same as saying the user input for a birthday should consist of certain data types. And if the data provided by the user doesn't meet those requirements, then the application should reject the data. So here's the uh, example. So as you can see, uh, we have like you know some validation. Uh, I guess some example of how the birthday should be, and if it doesn't match, then you just throw input validation ex uh, exception. This is just an example, but of course uh, you understand what I what the context this is about. Uh, the next validation is use the prepared statement and store procedure. So another approach to prevent this uh, uh, the injection attack. Now the idea here is to avoid what is called dynamic queries, which lead to an issue of the user providing input, which can then be executed as command rather than as a data. Both prepared statements and store procedures require application developer to build a code that specifies command ahead of the time. Next, the developer needs to ensure that the application only takes user input as data, which can be interpreted as a parameter to the query rather than command itself. So we are not constructing a dynamic query based on the user input. Uh, once again, consider the analogy we discussed earlier uh, about the file cabinet. So when an application allows dynamic query to come from user input, a malicious user can send malicious command to the robot and, and the robot will obey. So uh, I can add like single quote A is equal to A, and that would be appended to the query and, and considered as a command. So rather with the stored procedure and prepared statement, it will be considered as a parameter rather than the command itself. So prepared statement and stored procedure uh, so, uh, make it so that the only the parameters can be specified by the user. The function and the commands are already pre-written by the developer, so they can be changed or exploited. And this is what I have pretty much recommended every time when I come across such attacks in any of my testing. Now the third one is the list privilege. And and this is also quite important and, and most of the people just implement like, you know, store procedure and forget about the list privilege. And this is a, what we call defense in depth. So it's always a good idea to set up the access control permission to the database according to the principle of least privilege. 
This means that for every type of application account that has access to database, including accounts and data for the use both humans and by system, you should think about exactly what kind of access is absolutely needed for each account to do what it needs to do. So again, that's a concept of the least privilege, right? In some cases, this might translate to some accounts having only read-only access. Make sure that each type of account only has read access to the tables that they need access to and not all the tables. And and the reason for that is, uh, suppose like you know uh, you have been implementing the uh, blacklisting, whitelisting, or let's say prepared statement, but for some reason you forgot to um, uh, implement the same control in one of your web page or one of the input parameter. What happens is if attacker kind of exploits that parameter, they will get access to the database. Okay, but what if? Uh, we do not have this list privilege, then they could do uh, add entries to a database. They can create like you know their own admin role, and then they can use that to do certain actions and whatever they can do, right? But if we have the list privilege, if so, if if that function only needs to read the records, so like you know read the insurance from 2017, for example, then the th that function should only have read access to the database object, like it should not have the right access. So that way, at least, we are preventing a bit of an impact to to the to the application by uh, preventing attackers on modifying anything or, or preventing from doing anything malicious other than just reading the data. So that is that is why I, I call it as a defense depth, and, and that's why all of these three controls are super important to avoid injection attacks. And even though this is very popular, this has been on top of the pay, top of the OS top ten for quite a few years. I've, I've still, I can, I, I would say roughly like an out of ten applications that I would look at, at least I, I would find this in in four or five. So there's still people out there not able to fully mitigate this, and and this this requires a lot of awareness. So that's it for now. Uh, I guess uh, in the future session we'll cover some other OS attacks in depth and understand what the impact is, how do you mitigate, and what the actual uh, scenario is. So uh, thank thank you guys for watching. Um, uh, uh, hit the thumbs up if you like this video. Uh, also subscribe to the Cybersecurity TV Facebook page if you haven't already uh, to get the latest updates. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye.